You're listening to the Vibrant Happy Women podcast, episode number 113. And on this episode, you're going to learn how to be more financially savvy. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Vibrant Happy Women podcast, stories of vibrant women living happy lives. And now your host, Jen Riday. Well, hey, welcome back to Vibrant Happy Women. I'm Dr. Jen Rydie, host of this show, and I am so glad you're here. Vibrant Happy Women is about taking those struggles of life and learning to find happiness despite them, because part of the human condition is struggling, and we are just moving along for the ride, taking care of ourselves, healing our hearts, healing our relationships, and then shifting into that really amazing place of living our purpose. I'm glad you're here. Last week, I spoke with Aaron Odom all about what do you do when you're feeling financially frustrated? It happens to the best of us. And how do you shift out of that? Well, today we're going to continue our finance theme and I'll be speaking with Whitney Hansen and she shares some great tips about commitment and habits that help us to stick with a financial plan. Studies show that women often don't have a grip on their finances and they're not prepared for retirement. Well, I want to challenge you to listen to this episode and commit to being more financially savvy so that you can feel confident that all of your financial needs are met now and in the future. Well, I am so glad you're here and let's go ahead and dive into my interview with Whitney. My guest today is Whitney Hansen, and she's a money coach, content creator, host of a Plutus award-winning podcast, The Money Nerds, an adjunct professor and Facebook small business council member. As a money coach, she teaches overwhelmed millennials how to accelerate paying off debt and be financially independent. Some of her accomplishments include paying off 30000 in 10 months, wow, buying her first home at 19, and paying $472 for her master's degree. Holy cow, Whitney, I cannot wait to hear how you did all of those things. Welcome to the show. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks, Jen. I am honored to be on the show. I'm a big fan, so this is really exciting. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to have you. So little known thing I was mentioning with Whitney before we started the interview, I taught a finance class in grad school and I was telling Whitney, this kind of makes me really giddy because this is a career I almost considered. So I can't wait to talk to you, Whitney. This will be great. Yeah. Finance. I mean, it's a big deal. So I I think it's good that we have a lot of female voices coming up in the world as well. Cool. Cool. Well, let's jump in and have a quote from you and then we'll hear your story, you know, how you got started in this area and what we can learn from you. Yeah, sure. So my favorite quote, it changes every year and it's more of a life theme is kind of how I set my intentions for the year. And this year, my life theme is to go for no. And so what that means is that every single day, I have to put myself out there in a way that's very uncomfortable, but will force me to grow as a person and as a business. And so by going for no, if you are striving to get told no every single day, eventually, you're going to get some really great yeses. And so the whole concept is starting to reframe your mindset around failure and actually put yourself into situations where you will probably get told no in the exchange of getting told yes later. So that's something that I'm using to guide my life at this exact moment. That's so smart. It reminds me of that mindset of seeing the no or the failure as a success because every failure leads to success eventually. So seeing failure as a success. I love that. Completely. Yep. Well, tell us how you got started in finance, but I want to hear really how on earth you paid that 30,000 off and 472 for a master's degree. That's pretty impressive. Was it scholarships or? (laughs) No, no, that's awesome. So I'm going to take you clear back to how I actually got started into personal finance. So we're going to get a little bit deep and then I'll I'll make it a little bit more lighthearted, I promise. Sure. So how I got into personal finance was watching my mom stay in an abusive and addictive relationship for 20 some years. Ah. So she was married to my dad for a really, really long time. And she has six kids. So we have a big family. And what I learned and what I watched was that she was stuck in this relationship because of two things, really. She didn't have an education. So she had barely graduated high school, no college degree, nothing at all. And then she also did not have the money to leave the situation. So when you're in abusive relationships, a lot of times that's the first way that you are controlled is via controlling money. Yes. So she didn't have access to that. And honestly, it was heartbreaking to watch her stay in this relationship for so long 
because of money, because she didn't have the funds to leave. And so I remember one day we moved a couple hours away. I grew up in a little small farming city here in Idaho. And we moved to the big city of Boise, so the capital. Uh And we were living in this little apartment. And there were six of us, six kids plus my mom. And for a period of time, we were so broke, Jen, that we didn't even have money for basic stuff like a mattress. And so my mom and I were walking one day and we saw a mattress in the garbage can. And we took that home. I was 16 at that time. And we were so stoked. And that sounds completely disgusting for a lot of people. They're like, you took a mattress? What if it had bed bugs? Yeah. And for us, we didn't even care about that. We were like, here, this is awesome. We found something that was a basic need. Yeah. And so that's where I started to learn that money mattered and that Mm -hmm. there's a big difference between what we think we want and what we actually need. And so I've used that to kind of guide my entire life and work with my coaching clients too on asking that question, is it a want or is it a need? And so that has really guided everything I've done to this day. So that's where the business really started was I started to learn about that. I started to read. I became very interested in how to manage money, how to grow it, how to invest, all of that stuff. And then I went off to college and did my bachelor's in accounting. Mm. So I was a CPA, not a CPA, but I was working uh, with a CPA directly for a couple of years. But when I graduated from college, I learned that I took out too much student debt. Oh, <laughs> darn it. So, <laughs> yes, I know. And it's so easy to do, to be fair. It's it's check the box and you get your money, which for a 19-year-old feels like free money sometimes. Yeah. And so I took out all of that debt and then put together a plan to pay it all off. So that's kind of where I started helping people as well. Mm, so 30000 in 10 months. So what was the plan? There's got to be something amazing here. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> that's always the thing. People always think it's like this really crazy, amazing plan. And honestly, it was very, very simple. And I think most of the things that we do in life are. And so for me, the plan was I put together a budget. So just a really basic spending plan. Here's my income. Here's all of my expenses. And then through undergrad, I worked as a nail tech. So I did manicures and pedicures. That was my gig to get me through college. Ah. And so I worked that job for quite some time. It was a ton of fun, too. Yeah, yeah. I had a great time. Yeah, you meet a lot of really interesting people. So worked that job and had this kind of fork in the road decision moment where I finally was graduated from college. And I had to make this decision. Do I go full time into accounting or do I, you know, do the normal job, have a normal life, be off at 5 p.m., maybe work a couple weekends during tax season, but have a pretty normal life? Or do I do that plus work the nail tech job for a little bit longer? And so for me, that was the sacrifice was I'm going to keep working. So for me, that meant 70 to 80 hours a week. But Mm -hmm. the thing that was really cool is one of my big sacrifices was not stepping foot in Starbucks and not spending a single dime on eating out. I was so committed to that plan. And between the sacrifice and working the two jobs, I was able to pay off the entire 30 grand in just 10 months. And this was while I was making less than $50,000 a year. So it's very, very doable, but I was willing to sacrifice a ton. Wow. So that's kind of where it all started. So you use the word committed, which is kind of a big word I've been thinking about lately. Commitment is hard for a lot of people, but when you're committed, you really can do anything. So what do you feel like gave you that drive to be truly committed? I mean, that's huge to not eat out at all, really, at that age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because I was about 21 at that time. Honestly, it was the commitment piece came from being so frustrated and feeling so trapped by the debt. And I know that sounds so silly, because a lot of people have way more debt than 30 grand. And I get that. And it can feel very overwhelming. But for me, I started to realize that it was kind of making decisions for me. So when I had my first paycheck, I had to pay all of the debt first. So I had to pay this huge student loan payment. And I just, I didn't like that. I didn't like feeling not in control of my money. Mm -hmm. And so because that bothered me so much, that really drove the commitment for me the entire time. And then of course, there's little things that you do in, in your life where you start to remind yourself of the goal. For me, that was taping my budget to my debit card. (laughs) Oh, smart. So nerdy. So nerdy. But it worked. So every time I went to swipe my debit card, I had to physically remove my budget. So I had to see my plan. It was a pain in the butt. It put a little extra barrier into place. But it was another little step to keep me on track. And so honestly, the motivation came from just being frustrated. (laughs) <laughs> well, so you use the word nerdy. And I just thought, you know, <laughs> your podcast is called the money nerds. So what are some other nerdy things <laughs> you do with money? Because it might inspire us. Oh, I love that question. One of the things my fiance laughs at me about this, because he says I have an emergency fund for my emergency fund. So 
<laughs> <That's> <laughs> so great. <laughs> what that means is at any given point, I call it a buffer, but I guess you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> I have $500 sitting in my checking account at all times. Uh-huh. I will never drop below $500. And so for me, that's enough money to kind of prevent from having to tap into my emergency savings. So that makes me feel pretty good. The other piece too is I have an emergency fund for my business. So I have one for my personal life and one for my business life because we both know business is crazy. It's very cyclical sometimes. And so having the money to swing those expenses without feeling desperate is really helpful for me too. Oh, that's great. Well then tell us about the $472 master's degree. I've got to know. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, it's one of these little known secrets and I wish more people knew about it. So this is great. One of the things that I learned quickly was accounting was not for me. The cube life was not something I enjoyed. And so I was ready to make a change into what I thought would be corporate marketing. And so I decided that for my background and my experience, I needed a little bit extra education to help me bridge that gap. So I went back to school for my master's in business. But before I did that, I was looking through all the different ways. How do you pay for school that doesn't require a student loan or mm-hmm. any type of debt? Mm-hmm. Because I just paid off all that 30000 Yeah. And I kind of did that pinky swear, spit shake, said I'll never do that again. Mm-hmm. So one of the ways that I found was kind of by accident. I was Ooh. working at the salon and one of my clients was telling me that they were hiring somebody to do grant management. And I didn't really have any interest in that. So it didn't really excite me until she started mentioning some of the benefits. She said one of the benefits for working for a university is you get a discount on tuition. Oh, yeah. Five bucks per credit, Jen. So that's how I was able to do it. So I went back, worked for the university in a full time position. So it was 40 hours a week. And then in the evenings, I did a three year MBA. So lots of part time MBA work. And yeah, the entire thing cost me $472. And I wish more people knew that that was an option for them. Of course, it's brilliant. And so you didn't love that job, or did you? You thought you wouldn't love it, but how did it turn out? No, I definitely didn't love it. It was a great opportunity. I learned a lot, but I knew that wasn't something I wanted to do long term. Mm. But I didn't quite know exactly what I wanted. And so for me, I was willing to work a job that maybe wasn't ideal in order to get my tuition super, super cheap that still paid the bills in the meantime. So I learned a lot from it, but I definitely did not love it. No. Right, right. Well, that's amazing. Cool. I'm going to talk to my kids about that. So many good tips. Well, let's talk a little bit more about what you teach people who come in with all kinds of financial problems. What do you see first from most of your clients or people you're working with? Do you work with clients? Oh, yes, quite a few. Oh, yeah. Tell us, you know, what are you seeing when they come in typically? And then where do you go to fix it all? Yeah, usually what I see for most people is so much overwhelm that they don't even know where their spending is. So when you ask them, where's your money going? They're like, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not sure. And so usually that's where we start. And then the other piece too is just lack of clarity of what they want their financial life to look like. And I think for business and for your personal life, if you don't have that direction, then you're going to just spin your wills and you won't be making progress. And so for people to get very clear on what's important to them, what do you actually want out of your financial life? Is financial security a big motivator for you? If so, if you don't have an emergency fund or some type of savings or investment accounts, then you're going to feel very unfulfilled for the most part. And so it's getting them to think through what does that life look like for them? So we start there first Mm. and then we dive into figuring out where their money is actually going. And this is a very painful thing for people to go through. (laughs) Have you ever done that before too? Yes, we've been pretty, my husband's a master at budgeting. So when I'm on track and doing what he wants me to do, we know where everything is going to the penny. (laughs) But because sometimes I feel like it's a giant time suck. I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm glad you said that. (laughs) I'm really glad you said that because I think that's a a common thing too, where people are like, I just don't have time for this. It's going to be stressful. So Where to start is to, after you do your goal setting, you get clear on where you're headed, then go through and do the bank statement exercise. So this is a little exercise that I do with all of my coaching clients. And what I have them do is print off 30 days of their bank statement. So just the past 30 days of spending, credit card and or checking account, if you use both, print off both. And then look through your transactions really quickly and write down the three different categories that you are seeing that you either tend to overspend on or you're just not quite sure how much you spend. Okay. And then line by line, you go through and you highlight each of those different categories. So maybe your eating out budget is a green highlighter and then your coffee budget is a blue highlighter. So whatever you choose, 
but you go through and you get a better feeling of where your money's actually going. Mm -hmm. And the reason I have people do this, because there is software that will do this for you for sure. But when you're using software, you kind of emotionally detach from that spending. But when you're actually going through with a highlighter and you're figuring out how much you're spending, it triggers something different in your brain and you start to realize and take responsibility for your spending. So that's where I like to start. And this is not saying you have to change it all. In fact, most people, it's it just leave it exactly the same, but put it into your budget. So then that's the next step is to create a basic spending plan. Write down your income, estimate how much you think you might be making, list out all of your expenses, and then make sure you include those items from your bank statement exercise as well. So that's usually enough for people to feel like they're a little bit more in control, and then they can start to make adjustments if they feel like they need to. Ah. So that's kind of the beautiful thing is it's really empowering. You don't have to change anything if you value it. If you really like eating out and you like your avocado toast and your expensive latte, that's okay. Work that into your money plan. But just know that it, it could take away from paying off debt or some of your other financial goals. But if you like it, leave it in your plan. And so then from there, every single week, go through, set a money date for yourself. Maybe that's your time to go to Starbucks and get your coffee and update your budget. But just do a quick 15-minute check-in with yourself to see how much did you spend so far? How much do you have remaining? Do you need to reel it back a little bit or are you doing okay? And that's Mm. usually really all it takes. So the entire process should take no more than one hour per month. Ah, wow. So if someone's listening and they get it, they know they need to do this, but they're like, oh, I don't know. Is there an app or a few apps you would recommend for people that are simple? I've heard there are apps that simplify budgeting, especially for millennials, for example. Do you have any to recommend? Yeah, I think a good one is Mint. Mint, I wouldn't say is necessarily the best budgeting tool, but for that spending tracking, that will do it really well. So start with Mint, get a better idea of what your spending habits are, where your money's going. And then for a budgeting app, I'm actually a really big fan of Google Sheets. I think tracking it on your own is always the smartest thing. But if you don't like that strategy and you're not really into that, there's an app software that's called You Need a Budget, YNAB. And that one is super popular. It does cost, but it is worth the cost for sure. So that's another great one. If you're trying to negotiate bills or cancel unneeded subscriptions, there's an app called Cinch Financial that I'm really in love with. And then there's another one called Empower. So empower.me. And both of those will let you look at all of your monthly subscriptions that you may not know you have and cancel directly on that platform too, as well as negotiating some of your debts. Oh, It's pretty cool stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to put links for those on our show notes at jenriday.com forward slash 113. So I'm excited to try those. I've heard of YNAB, but I hadn't heard of the others. But yeah, Google Sheets, that's what we do. But I wanted to ask, if you're out and about, do you open Google Sheets right in your phone to check things? I do. Yeah, I, I personally do. At this stage in the game, too, I don't have to monitor my budget quite as closely. I'm definitely a creature of habit. So I know if I have this much money for eating out, I typically will eat out this many times per month. So usually I don't have to monitor quite as closely. But when you're first getting started, I think it's really important too. So for Google Sheets, just in case anyone doesn't know, you just download the app and then it's a spreadsheet that you can access from a computer or your phone and everyone in your family can have access if you need to do it that way. So yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it's a good one. I love RX bars. They're my favorite protein bar because they have simple, high quality, natural ingredients with egg whites, dates, and almonds at the core and no extra fluff. They're delicious. They taste so good and my kids love them. And whether you like sweet or savory or chocolate or fruit, there's an RX bar for you because RX bars come in 11 different flavors. And now there are three new flavors, which I love, mango, pineapple, peanut butter and berries, and chocolate hazelnut. I like keeping a box of RX bars in my van and in my entry closet and in my backpack, so I always have something ready to go or ready to hand to the kids when someone's hungry. And it makes me feel good because they're eating something healthy. You can get 25% off your first order by visiting rxbar.com forward slash happy women and entering the promo code happy women at checkout. And guess what? You want to order now because for a limited time, every order will receive six free samples, three samples of the new RX bar flavors and three samples of the new RX nut butters. This free sample offer ends on June 30th. Again, for 25% off your first order, 
Visit rxbar.com forward slash happy women and enter promo code happy women at checkout. I love being in bed because it's quiet and rejuvenating. And so I try to make my bed extra special with beautiful, high quality bedding. That's why I love Peacock Alley because they offer luxury bedding, bath basics, and fine linens that you'll love and that will make you feel like a queen. And we moms need more of that in our lives. Peacock Alley's products are made by artisans in their Dallas, Texas workroom, and they are super high quality. When I was in Europe, I fell in love with duvets and duvet covers, and Peacock Alley has fantastic goose down duvet inserts and covers, along with goose down pillows that you will love and that will make you feel so special. Peacock Alley offers a 100 night guarantee that you'll love their duvet inserts or pillows, or you can return them for a full refund. You can check out my collection of personal favorites from Peacock Alley by going to peacockalley.com forward slash happy women. And you can get 10% off your order by using code happy women at checkout. That's peacockalley.com forward slash happy women with the code happy women at checkout for 10% off. So Whitney, we've talked about budgeting and the steps. If people are using those apps, and you mentioned the highlighter. Is the highlighter kind of just the first time when you're getting your mind wrapped around it and then it's okay to go into the app world with finances? Correct. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Well, what else you want to tell us about finances? You know, once we get the budget under control, a lot of women think that I seem to have the opinion that a lot of women feel like they don't do investing or they don't think about retirement. Mm -hmm. Do you find that to be true? Or is that stereotype kind of fading slowly with time? No, I wish it was, Jen. That's such a good point to bring up. Most women, and again, we're totally stereotyping right now. Right. Most women do tend to not pay attention to their retirement account specifically because they feel like it's so confusing and complicated and they don't understand it and they're not math people and fill in the blank. But that's what we tell ourselves. So yes, that, that's something that people ignore way too often. And honestly, I think investing is one of the easiest things in the world. And it's actually one of the most boring things in the world <laughs> for the strategy that I personally use. Oh, yeah. And so it's very much passive funds. So index funds, ETFs, it sounds complicated. But if you're not sure, you can just go Investopedia or something like that to learn a little bit more about this. But I, I'm a big fan of doing the passively managed funds, which essentially means you have like a it, normal. OK, so an actively managed fund would be a person is sitting there watching every single stock account and they're making trades on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So that person has a salary and that salary is usually very expensive. So that cost gets pushed on to you as the mm -hmm. investor. And so just like your returns compound, your fees also compound as well. And so it can be very detrimental if you're looking at a longer term over 45 years of investing. So for the passively managed funds, there's still fees associated with it, but they're much, much smaller because they don't have that person that their job is to solely watch those all day long. Mm -hmm. So instead what they do is they essentially copy whatever that fund is doing. So if you have a mutual fund that's doing these certain stocks into this portfolio, an index fund might look at that and just take those exact same stocks. So whenever one thing gets traded over in the actively fund, it'll do the exact same thing over here in the passive fund. Uh, so you don't have all those fees. And so that's why I'm such a big fan of that. And if you're looking for a really easy way to get started with that, betterment.com is what I personally use to do a lot of my investing. Oh. It uses low cost index funds as well. And it's so, so easy to use. Okay. So if we got the betterment, is it an app, betterment.com? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an app or a website, whichever you prefer. Okay. Walk me through this. So you get the app and then... Uh -huh. What do you do? You know, because yeah. immediately my mind would go to overwhelm because there's so many choices, right? <laughs> For sure. So what it does, just like a financial advisor, if you're going to go talk to a financial advisor, they're going to ask you, how comfortable are you personally with risk? Mm -hmm. And so they ask you a series of questions to kind of gauge which investments might be best for you based on your age, your income and your comfort level of with risk. So Betterment does the exact same thing. So it'll ask you all these questions. And then based on your age and your situation, It'll make recommendations on a certain percentage of investments. So how much stocks do you, should you be invested in and how much bonds? So essentially equities and then debt, how much of that should be split? So once it gets a better idea from that, you can just put $50 from your checking account directly into these recommended funds that they suggest for you. And then you're investing. It's really, truly that easy. 
If you have to set up a traditional IRA or Roth IRA, also sounds confusing, but it's really not. It's just the way the taxes are associated with those accounts. Rule of thumb, if you're younger, go for Roth. If you're a little bit older, go for traditional. You can do both, however. So when you're doing that, it'll start to invest on your behalf based on that whatever designation you have. And it just starts to grow. And it's so much fun to see your account go up and down. The downs are a little scary. But you get to see that it does go down, but it goes back up. Mm -hmm. And that's usually what scares most people is when the market goes down, we feel like we lost all of our money. Right. But this will train you to start to change your mind when it goes down. You can start to see, hey, my money's going to go back up, but extra now because I'm still investing. And so it's really good for women, I think, especially. But for anybody that's unsure about investing, Betterment, I think, is amazing. You know, I've kind of shifted my mindset on that as well. When the stocks crash, I'm like, sweet, I'm getting a sale. You know, (laughs) I don't know why people get so afraid, but I heard Warren Buffett say you need to buy when everyone else is bailing and vice versa. So it's so interesting. Completely the case. Well, so Betterment.com. Roth or traditional IRAs. And we'll put all of this stuff in the show notes as well. JenReady.com forward slash 113. So just 50 a month. And then do you recommend that we increase over time or, or just whatever we feel comfortable with? Yeah, I think 50 a month is a good place to get started to see how this works to get yourself comfortable with investing, learning that it's actually a very easy process. And then I think as you start to pay off debt, That's a good time, especially your credit card debt, to pay that off first and then start to increase your investing into a much larger amount. Ah. Ideally, $5,500 a year is kind of the max for IRAs that you can contribute currently. So if you can do $5,500 a year, great. But if that's too much money, it's okay. Just do as much as you possibly can after you pay off the credit cards. So $5,500 a year, that doesn't sound like enough to retire on. So are there other places where we can invest if we really want a big nest egg by the time we retire? For sure. No, you're, you're right. $5,500 a year will not get you to the point where you are comfortably living on retirement. So the other piece to look into is your 401k. If your company offers a 401k, usually it's if you contribute XYZ percent of your salary, we'll match you 50% or 100%, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So getting those matches is very critical as well. Yeah. And so make sure that you do take advantage of that free money that your company will offer you. Cool. So I think that's another good way. There's also real estate investing. There's starting your own business. There's a lot of other strategies, but those two will get you going pretty well. Now, sometimes people will look at their finances and they'll figure it all out and they'll just say, gosh, there's just not enough money. And so what do you recommend in that situation as far as cutting spending or increasing income? Yeah, great question. So one of the things, if you cannot give yourself an honest analysis of what needs to go from your budget, then I highly suggest taking it to a close friend, having your friend look it over and ask your friend, hey, what would you cut out of my budget? What do you think is unnecessary? Scary. (laughs) It's so scary. (laughs) Yes, it is terrifying. But so much of the time we are so biased with our own spending habits that we're like, oh, this is necessary. My $600 a month car payment is 100% necessary. (laughs) Right. When really it's not. So if you're having a hard time cutting out some things, then I definitely do the friend test. Have your friend look it over and make suggestions for you. It's painful, but it works. Oh man, that's crazy. And then do you often tell people to just get that second job? I mean, where do you balance quality of life versus, you know, the need to have more income? Yeah, that's such a personal decision for most people. For me, I don't have kids. I'm not married. So Mm -hmm. it was a very easy decision to work 80 hours a week. I I say easy loosely, (laughs) but (laughs) yeah, (laughs) it still sucked. (laughs) Right. But for most people, if that's not something you can do, you've got to get a little bit creative. So there are websites like appin.com, which is essentially contract work that you would do from home and on your own terms. So that's one option. But I think everybody should have some type of a side hustle. I really do. Because that's where you're going to get the best results. And that's where you're going to start to make a little extra money for savings goals, for paying off debt, for growing your business, whatever it might be. But I think it's a really good thing for everybody to have. So you've just got to get creative. Maybe you do Uber Eats, where every Saturday you're driving around delivering food. One of my coaching clients does that exact same thing. Her and her wife will go around and do Uber Eats on Saturdays, and they bring in an extra $400 every two weeks. Nice. That's smart. It's so smart. That app you mentioned was appen.com? Appen.com. How do you spell that? E-P-P-E-N. 
E P P. Okay. It, yep, A P P E N. So oh, it's a, a okay. all contract work. They send you a contract and assignment. Sometimes it takes a little while to get your first contract, and sometimes it's not great money. It might only be nine dollars an hour. Yeah. But I did a contract project with them. It was nine dollars an hour, twenty hours a week for five weeks, and that was an extra almost nine hundred dollars over five weeks. Nice. So it does add up. That reminds me of a place I hire random people to help me out, and that's Upwork.com. When I need someone to, I don't know, do some spreadsheet work or help me copyright or proofread something, you know, there's just all kinds of kind of clerical type skills on there. So if you have any skill at all, Upwork.com might be a good idea. Just passing Upwork on a tip. That's a good option. That is a really good tip. Well, let's talk about some of your favorite things. Okay, so you're awesome with money. We hear it. We're jealous. <laughs> no, but when, <laughs> you obviously have a lot of commitment there. What does your morning routine look like? Is there something that you do that helps you just feel better inside so you have more commitment maybe that you could pass along? Yeah, my morning routine is almost exactly the same and has been for about five years. Wow. So I wake up at about 6 to 6.30, depending on the day. I've tried the 5.30 thing. It didn't work for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was so early. Right. But wake up, go downstairs, make breakfast. So every morning I always make my breakfast. It's usually two egg whites, two eggs, and then an English muffin with avocado right now is kind of what I'm going yeah. for. Make my coffee and then sit down. As I'm making everything and getting ready, I will listen to podcasts every single day. Uh-huh. I journal a little bit. My journaling is very basic. I have a, a little book that's called Q&A of the day. So you just write down a little sentence. It's a little tiny prompt. And so I journal in that. I practice a little bit of gratitude. And then I get ready for my day and dive in. So that's really, it's really basic, but I enjoy it a lot. Nice. That's good. Gratitude, I've heard, is just one of the most effective ways to make sure you're happy almost as effective as um, depression medication or even more effective sometimes. So that's smart. Q&A of the day journal. Is that something we could find online? Is that the name yeah, of it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. Q&A of the day. It's a five-year journal. Whoa. And yeah, five it's years. so interesting, Jen. You get to see how your thoughts have changed over the years or how they haven't. And it's basic stuff like what did you eat for breakfast today? Or what are you currently grateful for? Where, where did you last travel? So it's stuff like that. But it's really interesting to go back through and look and see what you answered before. Huh? Yeah, I'll have to grab one. That would be fun. What is your favorite easy meal besides your amazing breakfast? <laughs> My breakfast is pretty great. I am really boring when it comes to food. <laughs> so this stems from I used to be bodybuilding competitions. Wow. And so I got yeah, it's really cool. It was a ton of fun. So I got very used to meal prepping everything for at that time reaching my fitness goals. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that for six years now. So every Sunday I do my meal prep. So it's boring. I eat chicken and sweet potatoes or chicken and rice. So I kind of vary my starchy carbs. But that's really all I do. And so it's super boring. But I really enjoy it because it saves me money and it saves me time. And I don't have to sit there and think about what am I actually going to eat today. So boring stuff. But I'm a meal prepper. So let me see if I understand this right. So you pre-cook a bunch of sweet potatoes, you throw them in a Tupperware or something in your fridge, and you pre-cook a bunch of chicken and a bunch of rice. Do you like season them with salt and pepper, I suppose? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Garlic salt is kind of my jam, so I use a lot of that. But it's uh, I have the little containers from Amazon. I think they're uh -huh. like 9 or $10. They're uh -huh. the individual portions. And so uh -huh. I drop in my Costco chicken. So I do their Costco chicken tenderloins. And oh. about two and a half of those is about four ounces of chicken. So I've got it kind of down. So I'll throw that in my Tupperware and throw in my sweet potatoes and just throw it all in my fridge. So it's all ready to go, each of my individual meals. Wow. So even dinner is chicken and rice or chicken and sweet potatoes? Pretty much. I mean, occasionally I'll mix it up a little bit. But usually my fiance and I will sometimes cook dinner together. Mm -hmm. But it just depends on what we've got going on in our schedules. Wow, that's awesome. I think I might try that. <laughs> Just tell my it's kids, so we're nice. going to have two meals all the time. Oh, Take they, it they or might leave it. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, who told you that terrible advice? <laughs> oh, so funny. You know, if one of them were cereal, we'd be set, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Lucky charms for dinner. <laughs> right, right. Well, what's your favorite way to relax? Oh, I love hiking. Ooh, so I yeah. will go out in nature every weekend. I usually will block off Saturday on my calendar. So I try not to take coaching calls on Saturdays. 
and I will go usually for a three to four hour drive, which sounds weird, but I will listen to my audiobooks or podcasts, go hike around and then do the same thing on my way back. So it's very relaxing for me to not have to think and let my brain go on autopilot when I'm driving. Mm, yeah, yeah, for sure. And what's your favorite book? The Power of Habit. Oh, have man. you read it? Yes. And I can see the theme. You are just good at habits and commitment. I think it's probably because of that book. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Serious. Okay. It's such a good one. I think it's a, a quick read, very engaging, very good at storytelling. The author is incredible. And I think everybody that doesn't even like to read will love this book. The Power of Habit. Okay, got it. And what's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I ever received was when I was working at the salon. And I had a client that would come in every two weeks and I just adored her. I admired her life. She was a very successful woman in her 60s getting ready to retire, but was at the top of her game in her career. And one of the things that she told me was that I will always be successful if I live below my means and save my pay raises. And that has stuck with me ever since. Wow, that's really good. Okay, so... Reminder, everyone listening, the everything, all these quotes and books and links and apps will be on the show notes at jenreddy.com forward slash 113. And now, Whitney, what does it mean for you to be a vibrant, happy woman? Oh, for me, it's actually very easy. It's working on projects that are bigger than you. So if I'm working on something that's going to outlive me or help more people than just myself, it's also being in nature and exploring often and then saving your money. To me, if you do all three of those things, you'll be a pretty happy camper. Nice. That's awesome. Okay. Now let's have a challenge from you to our listeners and you can then tell us where we can reach you and we'll say goodbye. I like it. So my challenge to everybody listening today is to go through the bank statement exercise. If you need a little guidance, you can find it at WhitneyHanson.com slash PF exercise. There's no email opt-in required. You can just go through the video training. But go through that exercise or listen to the show again and find out the pieces and figure out where your money is actually going. So start there. That's my challenge to everybody for this week. How long do you think it would take? If people are you know, wondering how long this would take and they're on the fence, how long do you think it would take to go through the bank statement exercise? 30 minutes max. 30? It's very quick. Yeah. Okay. Everyone, you've got 30. You've got this. I just want to give a little cheerleading spiel. You know, everyone listening, be that woman who is financially savvy. Make the choice to bust out of the stereotypes because it's just a part of the empowering picture of being a vibrant and happy woman. So do it and then email us and let us know how it went. I love it. So Whitney, where can everyone find you? And also tell us about your podcast really quick as well. Yeah, the best place to find me is WhitneyHanson.com. That's where I okay. hang out mostly and on Instagram. I'm at Whitney underscore Hanson underscore co. So I hang out there mostly. And then the podcast is a ton of fun. So it's an interview style, much like yours, Jen, mm -hmm. where I bring on people with cool money stories or interesting careers. And I get to chat with them to learn their secrets to financial success. And additionally, it's we, we do interview every Wednesday. And then we do a five tip Friday every Friday. So it's five oh, minutes yeah. or less that gives you little money spiels there. And your podcast is called The Money the Nerds. The Money Nerds. Do you have a co-host or is it just you? I don't. It's just me. My co-hosts are only the people I interview every week. Gotcha. So you and the guests are the nerds. Got it. Yep, <laughs> exactly. And usually people listening in are wannabe nerds, which is great. Okay, that's me. I'm going to listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, Whitney, I had a blast. I love this stuff. Thank you so much for being on the show. And everyone go check out Whitney's podcast, The Money Nerds, and do the bank statement exercise at WhitneyHanson.com forward slash PF exercise. Thanks for being on the show, Whitney. Thank you so much, Jenna. It's an honor. We learned so much from Whitney. And now it is time to take action. If you're a member of the Vibrant Happy Women Club, we will be talking about this episode in our small groups this week, and especially talking about commitment and habits, two of the big things Whitney talked about throughout her interview. If you're not a member of the Vibrant Happy Women Club, you should be. It will be opening again in June, and it's a great place to be if you want to be around other women who are trying to live vibrant and happy lives. I'll see you all next week when I talk with Tracy McCubbin all about decluttering. Who doesn't need a little bit of decluttering? I'm on a massive decluttering kick and I can't wait to talk more about that next week. I will talk to you soon and until then, make it a great week. 
Take care. Thanks for listening to the Vibrant Happy Women podcast at www.jenride.com.